I think it was already on. Um, yes, they showed me where the switch was, and I couldn't find it because it was already on. Yes, it's on. Um, good afternoon. I am indeed Evan J. Marshall, your solo mandolinist for the lunch hour. And um, that last tune had nothing to do with the Christmas holiday. Uh, it just uh, kind of part of full disclosure about the uh, split personality of um, your performer today. Uh, you see, I, was, I started my musical life as a classical violin student, discovered country fiddle music um, uh, after about six or seven years of classical violin study, and by way of country fiddle music, got involved playing bluegrass and found out that there was a half-size guitar it's not really a guitar at all, but tuned just like a fiddle. Um, four pairs of twin strings. But it's the same tuning as a violin, so I had a head start. And um, I think the very first thing I ever did was... Um, to verify that it was tuned like a violin, and it was love at first sound. And so um, I, I thought what you, all that you did with the mandolin was play bluegrass. <laughs> and it turns out that, um, <laughs> thank you, um, you already applauded for that one though. Um, it, uh, it turns out that the mandolin actually was not invented in Kentucky in uh, the 1920s, but rather in Italy in the 1600s. Um, and initially, it was kind of a soprano 12-string guitar, six pairs of twin strings tuned like kind of a, a jazz chord that Django Reinhardt might play. And I guess some uh, mandolinists in Naples got jealous of all the fun that the... Um, uh, some violinists, rather, some Neapolitan violinists got jealous of all the mandolinists, and so somebody had the brilliant idea to construct an eight-string instrument, four courses, tuned like a violin. Whenever I say the word tuned, it reminds me I should make sure I'm in tune. Um, and so the Neapolitan mandolin came to be in the 1720s, and so I discovered the Italian tradition and I have this habit of making songs that aren't Italian sound Italian because I play them in the Italian style. And so, um, anyway, and then sometimes I even like to swing it a little bit. And so it's hard to find people who will perform with you when you say, okay, we're going to play... We're going to do a program of Italian classical, uh, Italian serenade, swing music, and straight-ahead bluegrass. Um, you know, so I had to learn somewhere along the line, I had to learn to play a duet by myself in order to make a com complete musical statement. So the way that starts is with... Um, you, you play the, the melody on the high strings with this shivering picking hand technique we call tremolo. It's, um, it's what gives the mandolin that Godfather movie sound. Uh, tremolo, it's the one technique for which stage fright is really helpful. So um, anyway, so when I play a duet by myself, I play the melody on the, the higher strings with tremolo. And then underneath that, I play a harp style obligato, no tremolo, broken chords like a harpist would do. So when you combine the broken chords with the tremolo melody at the same time, it sounds a little bit like this.
Okay, so we mandolinists call that uh, solo performance in duo style. It's kind of a pretentious, fancy name, uh, but uh, we mandolinists are eccentric, and um, there's a reason for giving it this complicated name, solo performance in duo style. The idea is it's two different characters of sound. It's not uh, playing in two notes at once, what, uh, what I or a violinist would call double stops. Which is a lot of fun. Nor is it um, playing double stops in, uh, in both voices in tremolo. Which is often necessary for the restaurant mandolinist which I have been. But it's this, these two different characters of sound, a tremolo melody and a harp style accompaniment. And there's a bit of a trick to it. Um, perhaps there's two tricks, really. One is you have to practice a really long time. Uh, but the main trick is that there's holes in the tremolo. Um, what sounded like actually has holes in it. If I slow it way down,
you can hear the holes, and in the hole goes one of those uh, harp notes, or maybe even a harp chord. It's time to swing it a little bit. You know, the, the holiday music rules is it's okay to play holiday music all the way until New Year's. So, um, anyway, the, the next two pieces on your program I'm going to do as a medley. It works out well that way in case I get lost. You see, these two songs have very, very similar chord progressions. So if I go through the musical looking glass from one to the other, if I do them as a medley, sometimes the audience doesn't know. Frosty and Rudolph.
So, um, as a musician, um, I, I, I really don't feel like I'm in show business and such. I, I hope and as, aspire to be in the inspiration business. You see, I'm, uh, I am a musician instead of a doctor or a lawyer for a career, um, as my mom would have preferred. Um, <laughs> I'm a, a musician because um, I heard musicians uh, during my formative time doing things and I just said, oh, I've got to learn how to do that. Um, I uh, heard Don Rich of Buck Owens and Buckaroos when I was just 12 years old playing the Orange Blossom Special on the violin, on the fiddle, I should say. I thought, I have to learn how to do that. And then I heard a teenage Marty Stewart, I don't know if any of you are country music fans, Marty's my age, but back in 1974, we were both 15. Um, and I heard him play bluegrass. Um, and I've been playing the mandolin for a year and I'd never tried to do anything that wild. And I thought, I just have to learn how to do that, or I just, I won't be able to live with myself. So, um, musicians and music have inspired me, and I hope that um, with my performance, I can uh, spread a little joy to an audience and perhaps inspire other musicians, other mandolinists. Um, so, um, this is an example. I mean, I, I, I never met Beethoven. I wasn't, I'm not old enough, but um, um, uh, a little, quick little music theory lesson. Uh, it, it won't be too involved. Everybody knows that um, a minor chord has kind of a sad sound. <laughs> if you want to write a sad song. minor chord. If you want a happy sound, you use a major chord. And sometimes you'll take that major chord and you'll put a seventh above the bass. In music theory class, we call it a dominant seventh chord. It's what makes people want to go, happy birthday. Um, when they hear it, because it's got to go somewhere. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not stable, as we say. It has to go somewhere. But there's a certain kind of seventh chord, dominant seventh chord. Instead of the seventh on the top, the seventh goes on the bottom. Very distinctive sound. And you have to be very careful if you're writing an arrangement and use a, you use what we call a third inversion dominant seventh chord. It has to resolve to the next chord in a special way. And there's this moment in Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. Where he uses that third inversion dominant in seventh chord, and it's just so magical. And I thought, I've got to figure out a way to use that in one of my arrangements um, to make it a little bit more, a little different from all the others. And so, um, this is that arrangement. Instead of hearing the um, dominant, the seventh on the top, you'll hear the seventh on the bottom.
Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. This, the next two selections will actually be a medley. Uh, you might not think that the William Tell Overture and Sleigh Ride go together as a medley, um, but um, there's a little bit of a story to that. I had um, uh, a job, a full-time job performing at, at Disneyland in a group called, in a show called Billy Hill and the Hillbillies. And my big moment in the show was playing the finale of uh, the William Tell Overture. And um, uh, so, uh, but there came a time, namely mid-November, when the bosses would come around and say, okay, come Thanksgiving weekend, every uh, song in the show has to have an, a holiday element. And I protested mildly. I said, except for William Tell, right? I mean, we can't change that. It's, it's perfect just the way it is. And the boss said, well, if you think it's perfect the way it is, then it's out of the show for the holidays. And so um, my brother, bless his heart, he's, he was part of the show and uh, has been my partner in crime for much of my bluegrass. He had this wonderful idea. He says, you know that spot in, um, in William Tell, it has this two note chord, what we would call in music theory class, a compound perfect fourth or a perfect eleventh. Anyway, it's that funny chord where that happens when the horns and the, and the winds are going and the violins are going and so you hear this This chord, well, this chord happens in a holiday song. And he says, so, Evan, what you do is you get to that chord in the William Tell and you're gonna go through the musical looking glass and you're gonna play, you're going, gonna go into this other song. And then when that chord comes back around in that other song, you segue back into William Tell. So, so that's what I'm gonna try to do. Hopefully it'll all work. That's the script. Sometimes we depart from the script. Um, before I go, thank you all for, for coming to hear me uh, perform. Thank you very much to Anita for inviting me once again. And thank you to the technical crew, Joel, Tim, uh-oh, and oh, Carl. <laughs> thank you to Joel, Tim, and Carl for their technical assistance today. to say there's a moment of audience participation. If you can clap just when you can't help help it. Let's do a little trial run. Beautiful.
Absolutely. Because yeah. the last time we talked about it, I never heard of it. You did? It, um, no. Why? <laughs> well, then, so, which is your correct email? Let me, because I have this email that's overrun with spam.